Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Aspen Institute Germany's sixth um, COVID and tech discussion in our in our discussion series on COVID and tech that we are doing with uh, with Google. We are delighted to have everybody here. Uh, we know people are still getting on board. Uh, we are, but we're going to go ahead and get. Uh, my name is Tyson Barker, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director and Fellow at the Aspen Institute Germany here in Berlin. And I run our tech program, um, and we've been having a lot of really interesting conversations uh, with Google and with interesting players in primarily Germany and Europe, uh, in German and English, on how Germany is mobilizing tech, what are the considerations, what are the conundrums being posed in this crisis uh, as we all... Use new forms of technology, uh, helping, enabling, and and transforming our lives. Um, we are going to have a conversation today about the data conundrums in the age of COVID. Um, and I think you know we've been talking a lot about uh, general purpose technologies, be it cloud computing, be it um, uh, artificial intelligence. And when we talk about data, data protection, and privacy, in a lot of ways, we're talking about. Uh, general purpose values and how they are applied and how they compete and and how we weigh them against each other. Um, so we're going to have a really interesting conversation today when we think about all the applications that are coming online um, and what that means for a post-COVID, a current world and a post-COVID world. And just a couple of housekeeping notes at the outset. Um, this is on the record. Um, it is being recorded um, and you can tweet under uh, hashtag AspenTech20. Um, we will post this later to our YouTube channel. So if you ever, if you want to catch anything, you hear something, you want to, you want to check it again, it should be up later this week. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and introduce our three speakers that we have today. Uh, the first speaker we have is Chris Bose. Uh, I, I know many of you guys, if you work in tech in Germany, you're very familiar with Chris Bose, but the way that I would describe him is he is the Christian Dosten of AI. Um, he's kind of one of the big explainers in chief of AI in Germany. Um, he is the founder of Arago. He's on the Chancellor's Digital Council um, and was the speaker for the PET PT uh, Consortium. So he is somebody who's been intimately familiar with a lot of the data debates uh, that have been taking place around uh, contact tracing apps and a whole suite of technologies that have been coming up to try to mitigate this crisis. So thank you for being here, Chris. Um, our second speaker is uh, Ulrich Kelber. He is the Federal Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information in Germany at the federal level, uh, a position that he's held since January 2019. But prior to that, he was a member of the Bundestag uh, uh, for Bonn, which he is still currently sitting in. Um, so he can bring several perspectives to this discussion, of course, both the kind of, uh, let's say, administrative perspective, which we want, but maybe also a little bit of the political perspective, given that he, his, his history and background. And our third speaker is Maria Alvarez. Uh, she covers data governance and privacy issues at Google where she has been for the past two years, and she is joining us from Spain. Uh, prior to being at Google, she was at BBVA Banking Group at their Digital Regulata uh, Regulation Unit, uh, and she also worked at the Spanish Digital Economy Association, where she also managed a lot of these issues. So, and I believe she teaches on, on data regulation as well. So uh, another European voice, uh, a voice from Google, who will be able to speak to a lot of these these, these big questions that we have. So with that, I'm going to open it up for the very first question to, to Chris. Chris, you know, I, I'm an American, I live here in Berlin, and I get a lot of questions from the United States asking, what is Germany doing right? You know, oh, the, 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 the metrics in Germany are so good about the resilience, the social cohesion, mitigating this crisis, but you rarely hear the questions around uh, tech mitigation. Um, and, you know, one of the things that people have been watching, maybe with some questions or maybe a critical eye, has been the deployment of and the debate around uh, the contact tracing app, which does involve big questions around data protection and privacy. You have not only had a front row seat to this, uh, the, these debates, but you have been a real shaper of these debates. Um, how would you describe what has happened over the last couple of months? What have we learned and what should we expect in the yeah. coming weeks and months? 
I think we've very much uh, learned the power of public debate, right? Because uh, most people involved in this want to avoid uh, being in the public. I mean, I have had some personal rough experiences uh, with uh, being called everything and the other on Twitter or having uh, so-called investigative journalists uh, uh, trying to diss me. Um, basically for stepping out and trying to do something um, for the general good uh, rather than just doing something commercial. Um, and I think that that is pretty tough on, on a lot of things. Um, I think that digitally we could support a lot of efforts around COVID um, in a much better privacy preserving way than we would do in the analog way. I mean, right now um, we've reopened restaurants and you have to put down your name and your phone number and, and basically disclose who you are um, because it's necessary, right? But that could have, like digitally, we could really have supported this in, in, in a lot of ways and, and we will, right? Because this, these, these applications are coming. Um, but I think we really get, get the, the comparison between um, what, what can be done in terms of data protection uh, digitally and what cannot be done in an analog world. Because normally, in normal circumstances, it's all, always the other way around, right? We see digital as it's always anti-data protection and, and so on if in, in, in the public perception. But if you look at this, it's actually quite interesting that any approach is, is better than, um, than uh, what we can do in the analog world if, if we want to manage the, the pandemic. And I think we're going to see a lot of that um, helping as long as we keep the data privacy up also on all these commercial solutions that are coming out now, right? Because there, you'll, you see a lot of things coming to have enable people to go back to factories or back to offices and manage teams there and actually be sure uh, that the right people work together and so on. All of that, um, if, you, if you do it digitally, you can preserve privacy at least to, to a certain level. Um, if you did that in an analog way, a lot of people would have to know a lot of things about a lot of people. Um, and, and I think that, that we will we'll see a lot of solutions coming up here. Um, and I'm quite happy that privacy is such an essential point. Um, what I think we forget sometimes is that um, privacy and uh, in this case, pandemic management, they have to create an equilibrium, right? We have to preserve privacy. I would say that that is really important. Um, but we also have to make sure that we manage the pandemic in the right way. And, and then we have to ask ourselves the question, if, if privacy is, is the baseline, like how far do we need to go um, in order to allow pandemic management and who to trust, right? So in, in the end, there's been a big debate. Can we trust governments with central data storage? Um, uh, can we trust tech giants with storage on the phones that they control and so on? In the end, we're already trusting both, right? We're trusting the, the tech giants because we're using our, our uh, phones. We're trusting governments because we live in the countries. Um, but all this discussion is, is in you. I would have expected a much more, um, a much less technical discussion about the topic of privacy, right? We've discussed a lot of things, uh, algorithms, type of system architecture and so on. We haven't discussed the question of, um, should this be mandatory or not, right? Is, um, do you, is it really my body, my choice? Because there are good arguments that it isn't. Because if you go out and infect someone else, you're harming someone else. It's not yourself that you're harming, right? So these are the, the questions and, and what does that have to do with privacy? I think those discussions have taken a back uh, seat towards uh, what is possible um, digitally privacy preserving against the algorithms that, that we have uh, been discussing. And, and uh, I hope this comes around because as I said, is anything that we can do digitally, if we keep privacy preserving in mind and not just do optimization for whatever, how many beers you can sell in a restaurant, the digital solution is more privacy preserving than what is happening in the analog world. And I'm not saying what is happening in the analog world is crap, right? Because if you want to do it analog way, you need to do it like this. There's no way around it. Um, but we can really show the advantage of digital here. Um, and and uh, it really doesn't matter um, which approach as long as you keep the privacy baseline. Uh, I would make to, I'd like to make another um, comment on data sharing because I think this is really important. There's lots of uh, uh, people gathering data right now um, on, for example, logistics. I'm gonna make a totally different example um, then, then the uh, co uh, contact tracing, because in, in contact tracing that there were proximity tracing, um, so much care is taken off of uh, privacy and there's so much discussion. But if you look at all the logistics that's happening behind it, um, there's a lot of data being collected and totally new players that are coming up on data collection. Um, 
and there there are new uh, monopolies on the way in terms of who can hold this data and we should bring up if we want to do good research if you want to understand more social sciences if you want to understand um, uh, a better way of of how for example the virus spreads or um, where people uh, are, are put at a disadvantage in society and so on those data can't be just stuck in wherever they're collected and it's a good example of of the way we've been doing data collection so far in a very stuck way i would i would like to maybe if we have a discussion talk about more how can we introduce data sharing of course in an anonymized way right into the whole part so that science can go better um uh, the, the social services can go better um and and we get better results on new data pools that are being created as we speak that's that's definitely something that we do want to get into in the discussion. Also, the commercialization. Where are the lines? You know, we're talking about when we're talking about health data, personal health data. Obviously, that's a very very sensitive class of data. Uh, um, and in Brussels, uh, which I think will become at least mature during the German presidency around data sharing, data pools, access to data, ownership of data. But just sticking with the um, the contact tracing app debates here in, in, in Germany, um, it was quite emotive. Uh, and maybe even more so than when you go into a restaurant and you sign, you put down your email address or you put down your phone number, writing it down by hand. Uh, where do you expect this to go from here? And how does that get de-escalated and build consensus that will actually lead to people adopting this technology? Um, I think that that this is actually working in an okay manner. Uh, I mean, uh, right now we're we're seeing in the media a bit catching up for eyeballs. Uh, if you look at, at what is happening with um, uh, uh, following uh, uh, someone like uh, Mr. Drosten or uh, myself, that who's who bombarded by uh, investigations, um, that of course is is strange. But if you look at um, the, the typical debate that um, that everything that is being done by tech giants, for example, is bad. We have not seen that in the media, media and I think this is really great because um, I don't think anyone started these activities uh, with uh, how can we do something bad in mind. Everybody wanted to help, and I've, I've been part of those initial discussions, and, and that's where it came from. Um, but the the point is that I think a lot of people have lost interest, which is sad, so we all need a big marketing campaign um, for, for these applications to be used. I mean, if, if you look at it, everybody is talking about this is just for the second wave, but the second, is the second wave coming? And if, if so, when, and how bad is it going to be? All right, those, those are the questions. And I think that we need to be ready by then. Uh, Ulrich, you know, we're talking about a lot of this stuff. It's, it's kind of like we're building this plane while we're flying it. I mean, even though it's Germany is getting knocked a little bit for its slow deployment of a uh, uh, contact tracing act compared to other countries like Austria or France, and there's a debate to be had. Really, we're only talking about two and a half months. So this is quite, quite quick to have this debate. Um, what are the considerations we need to be taking into account now for the acute situation because we're creating a value structure that we're probably going to be living with for decades, if not longer. This is a question that what the um, data protection authorities always um, uh, set on the table that uh, if we took decisions now, uh, they will be not thrown away when the um, COVID-19 uh, situation is over, but will be structures we are will dealing with uh, for, for years or even with uh, for a decade. Um, seeing or looking at the digital side of COVID-19, Germany wasn't uh, really good prepared. So there was um, too less speed on digitalization in uh, all the education sector. Um, the question of home office, uh, um, the um, all of the um, the um, uh, health. Um, uh, sector, even with the, a number of the local um, authorities not really being digital um, hooked to the uh, federal networks and things like that. Um, yes, we lost some time uh, in the beginning with the, some of the problems of the uh, federal system and going into some wrong directions in the first days in March. Uh, remembering that uh, the first idea was to use the cell phone network um, data for um, 
identifying contact persons, even they are not accurate enough to tell you if you're on the same street or not. Um, but in the end, we are now on the right track. Um, some of the other countries will be 10 or 14 days ahead, that's okay. Um, some of the solutions in other countries will be, um, be collected and uh, newly distributed. So um, with the beginning of summer, we will see um, um, a, a landscape of solutions uh, in Europe to, to find out uh, the way in the first wave, uh, Chris first, and uh, maybe be better prepared um, for the second wave. It's our duty to uh, always remember on the idea of privacy. There is no contradiction between health protection and privacy. Um, if you're doing it right and um, trying to, 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 to look out on, on basic values and principles on basic rights just from the beginning, and having privacy by design in, in your solutions, it doesn't uh, cost time, doesn't uh, cost money. Yes, it's a little bit of um, giving up some uh, business models or some solution models which are not in, uh, in line with these basic principles, but seen with, the, um, with the, uh, all these um, tracing apps now coming um, to the front, not only in Germany, but in France. Um, that they are respecting the uh, general data protection regulation. So um, this contradiction, which is always on the table, not just in the COVID-19 time. We, it's like these days, it's like every day's work, but just extremely accelerated. We found that, that uh, digitalization is being blocked by privacy. Business models are blocked by privacy or um, privacy is just for healthy people. We have that even in before COVID-19, and now it's uh, being discussed uh, widely. Like uh, Chris mentioned, people are going into that debate, and that is one which will lasting um, over the COVID-19 scenario. Um, the um, civil society, the community is discussing which kinds of solutions should be found for dealing with a, a challenge or a problem. And they are not longer accepting um, solutions which are fine on the technology side, but are not fine with um, ideas like privacy or not. That was now found with the, um, with the tracing app, but we will found that with other parts of digitalization uh, done by the government um, in the next years too. So they've seen that they can win such a battle in the public debate, and um, this will be repeated. Let me ask you something. So, uh, you know, living here in Germany, but watching these issues a little bit transatlantically, because Aspen is a transatlantic organization, you know, I've been, I've been struck by how national these conversations have been. And, you know, as an American, when we think about GDPR, obviously implementation takes place. There are DPAs in, in countries. In Germany, there are DPAs in Länder that have very, very uh, strong, broad authorities. Um, but the debates around uh, contact tracing apps, the debates around the uh, quarantine diary, the debates around uh, digital immunity passports, debates around symptom tracing, all these kind of things seem to be happening nationally. Now we're, that we're talking about exit strategies, um, how much are you in contact with your counterparts in Brussels and in other member states? And what are we looking at when we're talking about uh, you know, enabling travel again in the next month? So what, how much is this technology and the concerns that, that people have raised being Euroized, essentially? Uh, that problem that uh, even European challenges are always discussed on a national level is not new to the, um, to the scene. But uh, even the, um, seeing um, the, the news in the evening, the um, reports from Brussels are the same like reports from Washington or Moscow or Beijing. It's not part of interior politics, but foreign policy. Uh, that doesn't change on, on the public debate, uh, but it changed um, on the professional debate uh, inside uh, politics, inside business. So um, normally we are um, meeting uh, in the plenary of the European Data Protection Board once a month for two days um, to do all the work there. This is a, a body of the European Union, and it's... Um, uh, having um, can um, can act with the binding 
uh, guidelines and decisions and things like that. So even more binding than the cooperation of the German uh, data protection authorities uh, is uh, on, on the legal ground. So uh, because we can't meet uh, personally, so be, be, beside the plenary, there are a number of subgroups doing all the work, I think a number of 14. Um, because we can't um, meet personally, uh, we meet two times a week for two hours by video conference system. So Can we, we ask really, what video conference system you use? Uh, not the one we are now on, uh, but one of the European Parliament. So hosted on the server on the European Parliament, developed for the European Parliament, having a clear contract for what is uh, happening with all those uh, personal data, even personal metadata, which is personal data, to, to make that clear. Um, so two times a week for two hours to um, speak about all the ongoing work and special things to be dealt with uh, in the in the COVID-19 scenario. And so, for example, we published a, a, a guideline for tracing apps um, in a manner that it could be used for the so-called decentralized approach and the centralized approach. And this is um, binding the authorities uh, European-wide. Uh, Maria, you know, Google is kind of a, a general purpose company in many ways. I mean, they're involved in so many of these discussions uh, from R&D, you know, looking for a, a cure or a vaccine uh, to COVID-19 to obviously the uh, operating system discussions uh, for Android uh, to uh, enabling uh, schools to get back on their feet and, and do uh, distance learning. Uh, can you give us a sense of uh, Google's work with government and, and civil society on these privacy questions around COVID, and you work on data governance. What kind of global standards is Google adhering to, and what new questions are emerging? And then I got one more question for you. Sure. Um, good afternoon, and um, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to, to be here. So tech companies are playing a significant role in this current pandemic situation by allowing policymakers, decision makers, to make better and more informed decisions based on, on data, on aggregated and anonymized data, leveraging on, on data from big techs. And not only Google, but others have uh, uh, launched tools um, to help governments in this, in this respect, like, for example, to measure the effectiveness of social distancing uh, measures. We launched back in April a tool called Community Mobility Reports that basically those are, we show insights about changes in mobility patterns um, based on aggregated and anonymized location history data from users. So location history is an opt-in feature, only those that have opted into the feature have location history on. Uh, we launched it in more than 130 countries offering uh, data at uh, country level data and sub-country level data and also uh, with a breakdown by, by place categories, for example, uh, talking about groceries and, and pharmacies or, or parks and uh, transport stations, uh, um, etc. And this, as I mentioned, are based on, on, on these insights are based on anonymized and aggregated location history uh, data. And we, we built this tool having privacy uh, in the core of the design, following the principle of, of, uh, of privacy, um, privacy by design. We applied uh, a, a technique, the anonymization technique of differential uh, privacy that, as you know, is the golden standard of anonymization techniques. Uh, it was, you know, as you know, invented back in, in 2004 by, by, um, by Dwork and McSherry, and it's considered today the, the, the golden standard of, of anonymization techniques, basically allowing uh, to still be able to draw useful conclusions and, and to be valuable from a statistical point of view, but at the same time preserving privacy, you know, that by applying differential privacy, the, the output of the algorithm basically it's the same uh, whether a concrete individual is there or, or, or not and no individual can be singled out. So for example we use differential privacy in, in many of our, of our products and, and, and services like for example we use it in, in Google Maps for this functionality of, of, of popular times to show how crowd, crowded or busy uh, for example a popular restaurant is or, or a certain business, um, business is. Um, Apart from this, uh, from helping governments uh, to make better decisions based on, on aggregated and anonymized data, as you know, we have also um, made um, big efforts uh, launching the, the um, contact tracing solution, the exposure notification Bluetooth low energy uh, solution that also has 
privacy in the core of its of its design. We believe that, of course, the more people adopt this solution, the better and the more efficient it is. And, and we think that by having a strong privacy protections, we're encouraging people to 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 adopt this and to to help reduce the spread of the virus by by an early warning of, the, of people that have been exposed to the virus. So uh, we have, as, as I mentioned, strong privacy protections here. Like for example, this is an opt-in solution. So users have to make an explicit choice whether they want to have this functionality on. They can change their mind at any time by uninstalling the app or by adjusting the settings to have this uh, functionality off um, beyond the, 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 the Bluetooth uh, non-personal identifiers that are shared. There's nothing else that are being shared. But when, when a user that is uh, tested that is tested post, uh, positive COVID-19 and decides to share the codes of the last 14 days with the server. Um, and, and then just when, when, when a person that, that has been um, exposed to the virus is, is alerted of that, then the system is sharing uh, when the, the contact occurred, the length of the contact and the strength of the Bluetooth signal. But beyond that, there's no other information about the contact that is being, that is being shared. Uh, Bluetooth non-personal identifiers rotate every 10 to, to 20 minutes to, to prevent tracking. And Google and Apple will disable the, the, the system when, when it is no, no, longer, no longer necessary to fight the COVID-19 purposes. Apart from that, we, uh, as you know, in, in last May 4, we launched the, the terms of service of our, of our API that basically prohibits developers from requesting um, access to, to location data from the device or, or to request access to the list of contacts uh, of the device. However, the governments can ask users to provide um, in, information if they enter that information manually. So for example, they can ask for the phone number or, or, or zip code or, or email address. And, and another strong privacy, privacy protection is that we follow a decentralized architecture that, uh, as you know, uh, um, authorities have, have said that this um, is more compliant with, with data minimization principles that imply less data collection and, and less data retention. So you, you've mentioned a lot of very rigorous uh, benchmarking, a lot of different qualifications, uh, retention, consent, uh, 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 just general protections and the discrete nature of this enabling uh, Bluetooth to be used for this purpose. Um, but have we, are we breaking the seal a little bit here on enabling use of Bluetooth for, for tracing? And um, can you envision what kind of conversations are happening internally at Google to make sure that there are objective standards for implementing this in the future? Say a state says, oh, well, we have a terrorist attack. We need to implement something like this. Uh, what, do you, what do you say to that state? Well, this has been designed to be COVID-19 purposes specific only, and this is actually this is clearly um, state, we clearly state so in in the terms of service of, of our API that uh, this API can only be used for COVID-19 purposes. So only uh, developers on on behalf of go of, of uh, health government authorities can have access to, to to this API. It cannot be used for law enforcement purposes or for uh, self um, for individual quarantine enforcement uh, or for any other purpose. And and as I was mentioning before, we're committed to disable this capability once, uh, once the, you know, we've come to terms with the pandemic and when it's no longer necessary and we can disable that on a regional basis. We're currently right now like reviewing the criteria um, under which we'll, we'll, we'll be sunsetting uh, this capability because as you can imagine we're expecting that uh, the pandemic has a different evolution in, in different places of the world so we, we, we will do that you know, gradually and, and depending on, on what part of the world are we talking about. Uh, Chris, I know you are also coming at this from the private sector side. You you work. You're a founder. You're an innovator, um, but you clearly work um, in a in a policy space as well, and you're very familiar with the policy debates. Uh, let me ask you about uh, extraterritoriality. Questions around um, use of data. We're we're trying to operationalize a lot of data at once. We're having a lot of data conversations. How much are you worried about? Um, um, states like the United States uh, requiring by law access to data on servers held extraterritorially or uh, the responsibility of companies to render uh, data for law enforcement purposes, for example. Is that something that concerns you? Well, I mean, this, this is a debate that has been going on way before COVID, right? And, and uh, 
uh, where should you go? And and I think that democratic states have have a response to that um, by by putting warrants and uh, uh, judges in in front of such access. Um, it always gets um, problematic when those defenses are are in so, in some way defeated um, in in governments. But that is the case, of course, with non digital assets as well. Harder to get that though. So in in the digital world, it is it is way more important, and we're seeing a lot of that um, grabbing for for information or it's for law enforcement, it's for crime prevention and so on. But the real question is, is um, here, we don't want to go down the road of minority report. Right? That's not a good idea. In, in, uh, at least not if we want to change our understanding of, of how the law works um, completely. Um, so I, for me, this is, this is very, a, a very hot point in discussion, like um, uh, predictive policing and, and things like this. Um, that become possible with data analytics. And it's a question is, is this really, like, can we do this um, on, on top of most democratic constitutions? And I think that's, that's very questionable. Um, and it's not a question just of the US. And the, these, these discussions are held everywhere. Um, and I think that Europe has a big advantage because um, uh, this, it, it is very prominent here, not just after the fact, right? It happens, these discussions happen before uh, something goes out, and I think that's a good idea. And it also gives a framework to to uh, people who develop technology um, to say, like, okay, this this is something that that is a worthy business model, and the other one isn't, right? Which makes a lot of sense, right? It's it's horrible if you develop something and then you uh, can't use it, or um, you develop something and you're you're in a gray scale. I mean, in a, in a gray zone legally. Um, Maybe some people want to do that, but I, I don't think that that should be the norm or is the norm. Um, in that case, because we have a lot of discussions about what should governments have access to, what uh, uh, legal controls do we need in front of it, do we what type of warrants and so on, in, before anything ever happened in Europe, I think that that's a strong side. In the US, we have the same debates, right? But after the fact, and, and which is a, a weaker stance to start from uh, a privacy discussion. But in the end, it's it's the same in all democratic systems. Uh, Ulrich, um, that I mean, this is heartening answer. Uh, you know that we have rigorous, robust democratic debates that will hopefully keep some level of proportionality when talking about access by law enforcement and intelligence. Um, let me ask you. I mean, we're seeing a massive um, mobilization in Germany and Europe of all sorts of uh, video conferencing tools, of all these apps, a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, sensitive conversations taking place, a lot of protective uh, PII uh, being transferred. Are you, and you know, one of the things that Zoom, WebEx, GoToMeetings, BlueJeans, they all have in common is that they're all based in the US. Um, are you satisfied with the checks um, and redress mechanisms in place around the Cloud Act? And what do you think about uh, the, the levels of protection on that kind of data? And uh, CloudEck is not alone on the scene, so the European Union is uh, planning to have a, a common system uh, among European Union member states, uh, but um, also with uh, third countries like the US. And um, the idea behind that is, um, is fine. That means that uh, borders are not the same like in the analog time, and that the uh, processes uh, which have been successful for getting data on a um, analog situation, but which took uh, weeks or months to get that data for um, uh, police investigations or things like this, um, are not quite sufficient for the uh, digital age. So this is a, a common understanding, but the um, trying to, to, to solve that problem, they're going way too far. That means uh, wiping out all those check and balances which are in the system, um, like um, going, for example, directly from a US side or a French side to a German company and asking them for the, um, for the data of their users of, or their customers or the, just the uh, processing of um, the systems without having to make a um, st stop over uh, with the German um, authorities. And so it um, should be the, um, the obligation of the, the companies to detect, is that a, a lawful question? Is these uh, things they are going after even um, 
against law in Germany and things like this. And um, so um, this is not speed up now by um, by COVID, but it's uh, on the table. And um, a first idea we will have when the European Court is uh, judging over some of the framework parts um, of Privacy Shield. Um, so the, the European Court has adopted the safe harbor. And now it's the same person uh, going um, to the court um, with the privacy shield. And I don't think that privacy shield will be unchanged. There, are, um, there is development on the US side, seen from a European perspective. Um, but there are a number of questions unsolved from uh, having redress uh, mechanisms, having the same rights like US uh, citizens um, in court. Um, up to the uh, situation that um, this is a kind of self-certification, privacy shield. And uh, who is uh, watching if the self-certification is really the thing the companies are doing uh, in practice? And um, these are the questions we are giving to the, um, to the US side. Um, the answer is um, somehow unsatisfying, but um, right to the say, so this is the uh, 10th or 20th road with the US side. Where are your roads with the Indian side, the Chinese side, the Brazilians? Um, and yes, that will be one of the uh, questions uh, on the European side, which is, which, uh, what is with uh, data transfer to third countries um, and not only the US. So US is in the focus because of uh, the Californian side and all the others find a common um, solution for that question um, uh, from the European uh, perspective of GDPR and the privacy rights of German citizens, uh, sure. European citizens. I'm sure, I'm sure that'll be a big question. I'd be very curious to know how that's going to play into Brexit negotiations as well. We have a number of questions already. We have uh, one uh, uh, hand raised. Please raise your hands to ask a, a, a verbal question. We prefer verbal questions. The first one we have is from Emma Bulk. Um, and then we will take, we've got two written questions as well. So verbal or, or written. Elmer, uh, you're up. You unmute it. We gotta, can we unmute that? Talking is permitted. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. please. I have a very simple question, not to pri uh, privacy and all that uh, data protection question. Uh, but a simple question. When I talk, perhaps someone can give me a short answer to that. If we talk in Germany about this health app at the moment that the Minister Spahn is promoting. Does that work uh, also when I do holidays in Austria or Denmark? Or is it just for the national uh, level, uh, usable at the moment, when it really should come? Thanks for that question. Good practical question. Maybe, uh, Chris, do you want to take it since you've, you've got a sense of the landscape? So if the health app is is uh, the, the COVID tracing app um, yeah. in Germany, which is, is built on top of the Google Apple framework, then interoperability is, is part of the, the design. It's not fully solved yet, but of course the goal is um, to make sure that the various apps that at least work around the same standards or the same principles um, are able to interoperate. Um, can other apps jump onto this um, that don't use exactly the same standard? Also, there's efforts being made. So um, I don't think this will be from the get-go, but it certainly is what is being designed for. So let me ask you and perhaps Maria this question, and it's I, I, it's pretty basic. It's I think tapping onto this. If you go from a, a country that has adopted a decentral system, and you're in a country that has centralized processing like France, um, and I'm using the German app, what will be the interface? Am I transferring data to? Will I have to? Will I be asked for permission to do that? How will that work? Or, uh, I think that in that case, that, that you're saying uh, there should be in government app developers should should make sure that th this is interoperable. Okay, and then and then I guess maybe my app would ask for permission if I have the decentralized app to transfer uh, my data automatically to the French health authorities. I assume so, yeah. But this summer, but this summer there will be no interoperability um, among the European, um, different European apps. 
not even from uh, apps which are the same as the system, but installed on different server um, landscapes. So um, in this summer, you have to really install different apps on your smartphone, which is not so hard. Um, but you have to, to handle with the um, national um, health authorities uh, in the moment you are tested positively to, to, to share your um, responsibility even with the people you've met in different uh, countries. Um, so um, in the situation, all the installation of these apps are voluntarily. Uh, I think in all the European member states, um, uh, it's a question if the people are willing to uh, install one or two apps. Um, the, some people which uh, visit more than two countries are possible potential um, super spreaders of the virus. So we have to um, find a solution on, on, the, uh, on the long run, so end of the year for an interoperability, which is not so easy among different architectures, but could be handled. We have, we have a, a written question from Patrick and then a verbal question from Janos Delker. Um, from Patrick, he asks, how do recent developments in AI and quantum computing affect the risk of data security breaches and misuse? How can governments keep ahead of hackers and criminal organizations to protect their citizens, uh, i.e. tracking? Uh, so I, just to kind of reframe this a little bit and then I'm gonna kick it to Ulrich and then to uh, Chris. We're working with, we're processing a lot of new information, very uh, volumes. We're, can you hear me? We're processing a lot of new information quickly. We have a lot of new technology coming online. How are we making sure that the cyber is secured, that we're protecting inter, uh, integrity, confidentiality, and accessibility of data? Ulrich and then, and then Chris. Both of the topics are uh, f uh, from interest from the data security side and the data protection side. So. Um, quantum computing, even if it's uh, some years from now, is um, uh, for the uh, question of anonymization, of um, technical measure uh, uh, methods to, uh, to secure data, um, uh, interested especially for data which are already safe uh, in a pseudonymic way or a different one, and um, has to be um, reprocess to protect them from being um, repersonalized or just uh, decrypted with new methods um, on the market. Um, the, um, the use of um, artificial intelligence in more and more sectors um, of uh, processing of uh, personalized data would change the way of how the uh, data protection authorities have to counsel uh, companies and um, government and how they can um, inspect on data processing dramatically. So um, just to take the situation for secret services, uh, some uh, when, when my institution was founded 40 years ago, uh, they go inside and said, uh, show me your uh, papers and uh, look into the papers. Some years uh, after that, they asked for some sequential databases and uh, looked how they process the data in their databases. Uh, now we are at the level of having relational object oriented databases um, with the interoperability not, among, uh, not only among um, different services in one country, but uh, cross border. Uh, and now they are starting to, to use AI methods on those uh, databases, already using that like volunteer and other than that, and uh, how to really investigate and to watch if this is done properly is very different. And um, it's one of those uh, the topics the, uh, the, the uh, surveillance uh, authority, um, supervisor authority of those uh, uh, services are uh, discussing these days. Chris, I know you, you work at a lot of this uh, cutting edge technology AI, probably you're very familiar with quantum computing. Um, how do you see this, you know, affecting uh, data security and how can we make sure that this is uh, managed effectively? So first, let me say I'm very happy that Patrick asked this question for two reasons. A, he was not so much focused just on the government side. 
and we have been a, a have had a very long discussion about or debate about um, how what governments do and how risky it can be. I think in the private sector we have a lot of risk and there's a lot of, of uh, criminal activity going on um, right now uh, also. I mean, some just annoying like Zoom trawling and some outright criminal. Um, but the, uh, that is hardly in the discussion or what happens if companies steal data and what, how they reevaluate it and so on. And I think that uh, Ulrich is totally right saying quantum computing is still uh, quite a bit away. We can we can we have the opportunity to prepare for that it's our choice whether we do properly right uh, um, but what has happened is because for example a lot of marketing evaluation is not done right now there's a lot of server capacity available in these machine learning farms in countries that have very little data protection regulation um, and they are rented out to whoever pays for them right now mm -hmm. um, and of course that you you have access to very cheap massive compute power if you know where to go um, and I think that, that we're already there. And I think that, that the real question um, that, that we need to ask ourselves is um, how do we want to use this? And the, the dangerous part about AI is that AI learns from us as people, right? And um, then multiplies what it has learned from us. And people are biased. Um, there's no way around a person not being biased. Like that's how people work. But then if we multiply these biases and, and prejudice, um, what happens uh, in this case? And I, I'd say with the massive learning uh, uh, availability that we have now and a lot of stuff being piped through AI, um, it, it becomes even easier to evaluate people. Um, and I think that is something that we, we have to have an eye on, uh, potentially regulate. Um, and and uh, in any case, um, have have to look at in terms of what do we want to implement uh, where, right? And, and a very important thing is that we have a very strong focus on government. And after we have a strong focus in government, we have a strong focus on companies like Google or, or Facebook and so on. Um, but the real problem occurs somewhere else, right? Much smaller players who happen to steal or get a data set from somewhere and then have this massive compute power uh, available and, and can multiply bias or can even do outright criminal things um, who are much less in the radar. Um, and I think that that is really critical. Um, and uh, I mean, in, in, the, in the last few years, there have been a lot of analysis how government actors or state actors are influencing um, uh, elections and so on. Look at how companies are influencing public opinion or even much, much smaller uh, things uh, that, that are happening now with the everybody stuck at home and we're basically glued to viral channels. Um, it has become so much more easy um, to actually not just have the po possibility to influence, but to execute the influence, influence that we're doing. And I think we have to have a very strong um, look at this. Um, and I think that, that most likely um, data protection regulation will expand much more into the commercial sector. I, I, right? I, so. I would love, to, uh, we have a couple more questions and I know we've got 12 minutes. If, if, if we get to it, I want to ask a couple questions about discrimination, automated discrimination and bias, particularly at Maria. But first we have a question uh, from uh, Janos Delka. Janos, you're up. And then we have a couple written questions as well. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. All right. First of all, thank you very much for doing this. This is very interesting. Um, I'm a correspondent with Politico. I'm covering artificial intelligence, but I want to ask you about the apps. And my, my question goes to Maria, and it's sort of addressing the elephant in the room. Um, yesterday, we had five European countries um, publish an op-ed in newspapers across the continent uh, in which they criticized tech companies for what they called imposing their standards on these contact tracing apps. Um, there was, you know, here my home country, Germany, is in your home country, Spain. And the governments also said, these ministers, they said that, in effect, the tech companies neglected governments to have the final say in how the underlying architecture of these apps should look like. Um, they did not name any companies specifically, but this was about the API that was released by Google and Apple. Um, so this was apparently addressed to Google and to Apple. So what would you say, is that a fair criticism and what would you respond to it? 
Um, I, I've read that that op-ed, that joint op-ed from several secretaries of state of digital, including the, the, the Spanish one, but um, my my interpretation is not as negative as, as yours. I mean, I of course, they were mentioning the need to preserve European values. Uh, they were also highlighted the need to, to have interoperability. But at the same time, uh, we're having conversations with many of these governments. Our conversations are going well. Some of them are moving forward. So um, to be honest, we're not seeing the, or not interpreting that that, uh, that op-ed as, as, as so, so negative. We have a, uh, a couple questions for you, Maria, and they're kind of related to this. I'm going to ask the one from uh, Marcel uh, Rosenbach first. Uh, he says, will Google and Apple come up with their own uh, app on top of the API? Uh, when is this to be expected? How does this fit with the announcement that Google and Apple only want to support one app per country? Um, okay, so the first part of the question, no, we're not coming with our own app. We're just... Uh, of building this technology solution based on both of the energy so that governments can build their own apps, but we're not, not building any app. Um, when we launched back, uh, when we made this announcement back in April, we said that uh, this, annou this announcement had two stages. So first in mid-May, that was actually uh, uh, last May 20th, um, APIs, we launched the API so that these are available for, for developers on behalf of government authorities, and then in the coming months, um, we will be making this uh, exposure notification functionality available at operating system level. But in the meantime, uh, and the moment we're at is uh, launching these APIs for, for governments to develop the, the app. And we don't, we're, we're not gonna develop our own app. That's not the purpose of this. Okay, we have, we have a couple more questions, written questions. I'm gonna read the one from Erhard Sieger, the one from Julia Han was that's it's kind of broad, um, but I think Maria touched on it. Uh, from uh, Erhat, we have uh, when we have the se when the second wave comes, we'll have the advantage that we can uh, mu we're much further along in fast sharing relevant information among us than in spring of this year. So you know we'll be we'll, we're aware of what's coming. We can anticipate it a little bit in the second wave. Are we really sure that we do not want to lose this advantage due to overweighting uh, data security? Um, let me give that question to Maria and to Chris, and, and to Ulrich as well, please. Maria, you start. Um, uh, you were frozen a little bit, so I don't know if I, if I understood the question correctly because you were frozen for a couple Oh, sorry. If, if basically, are we, uh, are we losing our advantage in, in really preparing? It's, it's similar to the question of conundrums generally. We're weighing competing values. Are we losing the value of efficacy and safety, uh, at sacrificing it at the altar of data security and privacy? I think that uh, what we're doing is trying to strike the right balance between different values that all of them have to be to be preserved. I mean, we've seen uh, on data protection authorities saying out there that uh, data protection shouldn't be an obstacle to, to public interest, to public health. And at the same time, we have to preserve, have to preserve security, have to preserve privacy. We have to, to, to preserve public health as well. So I think it's a matter of striking the right balance and do not sacrifice one value for the other because we need to, to you know, to, to, to have a, a, a good balance between all the, the values that we need to, to preserve. Chris, do you have a, a comment on this? Well, I mean, this, this is precisely the question, right? You can't just do one. And I think that what I really disliked about the algorithm and architecture discussion was that it was just about algorithm and architecture and not about uh, pandemic management at all. Um, and, and uh, for example, I have been villainized for saying that government should have the choice between centralized or decentralized systems um, because if they can make use of it, and if, if privacy preservation is the baseline, uh, then they should have the choice. But once they make the choice, right, in, in either way, then that's the way to go. Um, and they have to cope with the outcome. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question. Um, if you can't even profit from uh, doing data analysis, then you should never collect the data, right? Uh, in, in, and profit 
in, in terms of pandemic management means sending fewer people into isolation that don't have to go into isolation or um, sending fewer people that are at high risk uh, to the outside world. But most um, facilities don't even have the capability in place, right? So there's the question. But unfortunately, this question um, or this discussion has not been had really so far. How far do we need to go and so on? The funny thing is um, the, the uh, data protection agencies, they have had this discussion in the beginning. They said, like, look, like Maria just said, we don't want to stand in the way of, of uh, managing uh, infections. Um, but there is a baseline that we have to adhere to. Um, and I think that this discussion, that is a, to me, was a public debate that was missing. But uh, it's too late now, right? Because we're, um, it's, it's happening right now. And I think it's much more important to have it, have the results now. Um, besides, besides, besides the fact that you can never overweight uh, basic rights, <laughs> yes. um, I, I, I don't see the trade-off. Um, you can do a proper support of the things which have to be done fighting the uh, pandemic situation, having uh, data security and data protection on your side by design um, of the solution. Um, there has to be done a lot of things outside the digital area. So for example, well-equipped local um, health um, um, agencies, um, having um, enough test capacities, without that even a digital solution won't help anything um, to have that. We can have um, investigation and research on, um, on data for uh, finding out more about the real situation of the um, uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic, because it's maybe some different to the uh, influenza, uh, influenza situation. We are now just copying uh, some of the, um, of the knowledge of the influenza on the new situation. So all of this can be done, and not because um, I want only to focus on one thing, so having a solution. No, don't give up the, the basic ideas of having a transparent, secure and privacy-friendly solution of the same thing. And the, the apps are showing it works. Uh, let me take up an issue that Chris brought up earlier, which I think is really important. It's definitely important in the AI discussions, but it could be quite important as well when we're talking about uh, adopting all these, these technologies for uh, managing the, the pandemic. Um, and that's the question around uh, discrimination. Um, I don't know how much this fits in directly with privacy, but I can think of a way. There's a big debate here in Berlin about how do you create incentives uh, to get people to adopt tax incentives or otherwise. Uh, the implicit kind of message is how do you get people, do you nudge people to render data uh, for, you know, to get eyes on the general situation? And that could lead to uh, discriminatory action. Uh, sometimes, you know, taking away privileges like flying, perhaps, or being able to enter into a restaurant, but it could also lead to stigma, um, different treatment of different groups. Is this something that, uh, let me ask you, Ulrich, and then and Maria, and then Chris, is this something that you consider at all in the privacy world? Because basically what you're doing is creating a culture of expectation that people will be rendering this very, very personal data. And how much are you dealing with these kind of questions? They seem very cutting edge, but I, I'm wondering how much you guys are thinking about it. Um, some months ago, I've uh, stated that uh, not um, data are the currency of the digital age, but trust. Because with uh, all those numbers of uh, algorithms, sensors, uh, gadgets um, being on the way, um, you will never really um, be able to um, inspect if everything is done right in your privacy manner, on your but you have to trust in vendors and processors uh, of those data. Uh, and that's the same with the governmental side. Um, I think there, um, there is some trust lost on, on the national German side um, in that debate, but not uh, from the debate about architecture and algorithms, but of uh, people from the second and third row of politics coming out saying it has to be mandatory or you have to give incentives for that and uh, for people who are just watching the debate on the development, uh, they don't really have a knowledge about who is who in that debate 
and what will be at the end. So um, we have to trust in the responsibility um, of, of citizens in, in free democratic societies. And we have to, uh, to lead by example. So um, me personally, I, I'm aware that in the, in, in, in the moment this app is uh, done in a proper way, seen from the um, privacy side, I will install it publicly. To, to show that I'm trusting in that uh, situation. I want to, to share my part um, in that situation. That would be the first good thing. And I was, um, if I'm debating with the people who are asking for making it mandatory or just the other side of the medal, giving benefits if you install that one and say, how do you want to really test this? Do you will give policemen or just people from a local um, authority the right to inspect in a smartphone, to, 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 to watch out, is there the right uh, operating system installed, the newest update, is Bluetooth enabled, uh, or like on German autobahns, you have um, penalized if you're running out of fuel on a German autobahn, will you be penalized if you're running out of electric power in your smartphone? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. You, I can't imagine how that should work in open society. So just ending that debate and really, yeah, it will be kind of a campaign to convince a majority of people installing that app and sharing um, their part um, of responsibility. Uh, Maria, I know that Google has had thought long and hard about questions around data and discrimination. Um, how much are you thinking about it in, in terms of these kind of uh, quarantine diaries, apps, this, this kind of thing? I mean, in general terms, whenever we talk about uh, algorithms uh, and big data, of course, they're, they're, we have to take into account that there are always risks around privacy and, and discrimination. And this is why the, 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 the GDPR and privacy regulations put in place measures to, to make sure that there are guarantees in place like whenever there is profiling automated decision making like for example article 22 G, uh, gdpr that that this organization must explain the logic of, of algorithms avoid black boxes algorithms where you know the input on the app or the app and the output but you cannot explain how you come from one to to to, to the other so i agree that for this exposure notification apps or contact tracing is uh, we need trust so that individuals adopt this this uh, solutions, and this is why, for, for example, for the case of our of our solution, we have gone through a, a strong review process and making sure that we are uh, GDPR compliant and we've gone through a strong privacy impact assessment assessment in this respect. Right, Chris. A final word for you. Um, on on this, I think this is a very interesting debate. Right. Um, let me make very clear. I think personally. I think voluntary is the only way, and it's exactly the, the argument that Ulrich is making, not so much about how will you control it, but about the de democratic statement that people act in their responsibility as sovereigns of a country um, to take part in this, and they do it voluntarily because they believe in it. And if they don't believe in it, they don't do it, right? And trust is exactly the topic that we're talking about. Um, I think on the other hand is that um, the discussion between having it mandatory and voluntary is a valid discussion, as I said, I'm clearly for the voluntary camp, is a valid discussion because if you, if, and if you wanted to make it mandatory, it would have to go through parliament and it would be a proper democratic process and so on. Um, and I think it would not be winnable, but that's a different place, right? So um, I think the nudging, that's much more dangerous, right? That could happen if you own, if you own a restaurant and you say like, um, I don't want to be shut down easily, right? I only want low, low risk people in here. Um, I'm only allowing these guys in. Um, then you start discriminating. So, and doing the same stuff with taxes and so on. I think nudging is the much more, um, in terms of, of civil rights um, and equality, is the much more dangerous principle than in there. Because mandatory or not, that's kind of, or voluntary, that's binary. And always it has to go through through parliament, which is the, the proper way. And there's discussions and we can go out and protest and, uh, in, in nice Zoom meetings or whatever. But nudging can happen in so many different ways that is that is much more dangerous. Um, and this is also a good part about the APIs that are currently used. They don't support this, right, in, in the Apple and Google side. Um, I, I think that's, it's, it's a fascinating debate. I know there's discussion in the Bundestag about whether or not there should be a law uh, regulating, regulating <laughs> that. 
we'll see we'll see if anything happens um but we're going to have a couple of uh, very very frenetic weeks ahead of us going towards uh, june thir uh, 15th um but for today i want to thank the three of you for being here Ulrich, maria and chris this was an excellent discussion we only went five minutes over um and we will continue this discussion in the coming weeks with our next conversation on on digital ethics with uh christiana Bopen. Uh, but for now, thanks for being here, and we will see you all soon. Thank Bye, you very much. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.